many of them working outside have not got the visa to go and work in these uh, BRI projects. Uh, I mean, the connectivity issues uh, require a lot of uh, labor migration. The technical staff uh, do surveys, etc. Many nations have actually shut down. Uh, 2020, 2021, 2022, these three years, nearly we have not had much uh, movement. Uh, aviation industry is shut down. Uh, all cross border movements have all been shut down. And so there is obviously uh, a problem here uh, for the DRI from uh, COVID 19 related. Uh, but of course, there is the vaccine movement uh, and the uh, uh, aid programs and others, which have created a little bit of uh, uh, support for people around uh, these countries. China did uh, contribute uh, nearly 80 million doses of, of vaccines. Uh, but like in China, the effectiveness of these vaccines was actually problematic. So it actually uh, led to image problems for China. And now the surge in COVID cases in China is creating a lot of uh, other problems uh, in addition to the, the vaccine-related issues. The Brazilians found 56% effectiveness in Sinopharma, uh, which means 44% uh, you are not sure whether you are going to get the, uh, the virus infection. Uh, so this is one uh, problem. The second problem is Ukrainian conflict from February 24th this year. Uh, this has created havoc in the in the uh, energy, fuel, fertilizer, uh, in these three issues. Uh, and Eurasian region, that is the focus of the BRI. Remember Xi Jinping in, inaugurated the BRI in Nazarbayev University in Astana in September 2013. And uh, in October, he went to the Indonesian Senate to inaugurate the Maritime Silk Road, which is the second component of the BRI. So the, these were affected, especially the Eurasian region was affected with the Ukrainian camp. Uh, and uh, the Chinese used to send uh, Right volumes to Europe, Poland, Bel Belgrade, uh, Romania, Hungary, uh, and other countries. Uh, so, for a total of I think 6,000 trains were taken, uh, and 450 million dollars worth of goods has been transported to Europe uh, through these uh, right trains that carried a lot of these HP uh, computers. Uh, or others. Uh, and then when they got back from Europe to China, they hardly had anything to carry. So they were carrying uh, vegetables, wine, uh, or whatever that the European countries Because much of the European industry has shifted towards the uh, towards the uh, towards China. So the second factor, Ukrainian crisis resulted in a, uh, a relative decline in the BRI, especially the continental route of the BRI, especially Moscow, uh, Mongolia, uh, uh, the, uh, the routes towards the Middle East, Iran, uh, and of course the Afghan crisis as well has resulted in the closing uh, down of the BRI. However, the, uh, uh, there is now uh, Xi Jinping wants to revive the BRI, and so let us see um, next year if there is a uh, there is a summit level meeting, and uh, if the because the Chinese are also flexible. Remember, in the first BRI meeting, they said unilateral. Uh, this is a Chinese initiative. In the second summit meeting, they said this is a multilateral initiative. So they made a mid course action for the BRI. So, which means in the third summit, probably they will say some other issues which may be useful for many uh, of our countries. Professor, uh, in this context, if I recall, uh, President Xi Jinping in September 2021, he has a 
new initiative like GDI, GSI and other initiatives. So along with the PRI, how the China is uh, uh, able to go with the security initiative and then another initiative which is less talked with the global health initiative also. After this COVID they have added. And uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi in Shangri-La dialogue, he has been able to explain about all this initiative. So, do you, you don't think that uh, due to some failure or some uh, due to this BRI, the has a new initiative in this part? It is still not clear what exactly the GSI, GDI are. Global security initiative and global developmental initiative. Uh, in, if you look at since the 1980s, the Chinese have been floating several concepts. Uh, first was the keeping a low profile by Chen Shaoqi in 1989. In uh, 90s, they floated a concept called new security concept. Uh, and then later on in 2002, they proposed a peaceful rise of China. And then it was modified into peace and development uh, because Malaysians, Indonesians uh, complained that their automobile industry will be gobbled up by the Chinese automobile industry. So the peaceful rise has been transformed into peace and development. Uh, semantics are also important here, uh, but the, uh, the Chinese have the habit of changing many of these. Uh, and then again, in uh, when Xi Jinping took over, he mentioned about China trade, China trade unions, uh, and uh, uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics under the new era, uh, and other initiatives. Now, we have a new concept, uh, that is the uh, Global Security Initiative and Global Development Initiative. They have not defined exactly, except for six, seven components of the GSI. So, in GSI, again, they mentioned about what is there in the new security concept? That is uh, mutual trust, win-win cooperation, uh, and uh, I'm forgetting the, the third. Uh, the same thing has been repeated in the GSI uh, global security initiative. So there is a lot of repackaging. Like many of the projects that we before came under normal uh, infrastructure projects, they are all now grouped under the BRI. If you have seen from 2013. Many of these projects have been renamed as BRI projects. Likewise, the GSI also included a lot of concepts that Chinese have been floating uh, for long, uh, for the last 10 15 years. Uh, so, in this slide, what we can say is GSI is also going to be transitory, although this is a global security issue. Previously, BRI is only in the six areas. Now, global security is a global initiative. So, uh, in, the, in, in the light of China becoming second largest economy in the world, now they are 19 trillion dollars GDP, and so now they have their sites are at the global level. Not at simply regional, Asian, South Asian, but at the global level. And that is the problem also for the US to address, uh, because US is the global hegemon. And now China is saying they want to be uh, the challenger to this hegemon and replace the US. So that is where we saw the decoupling during the Trump administration, the tariff wars, uh, and uh, various other measures that they are undertaken in South China Sea. That is the phone offs, freedom of navigation, and overflight operations on Taiwan Straits, on various other TPSA. Tibet policy support act by the uh, Trump administration in order to address the 15 Dalai Lama related issue. So in the light of all this, the Chinese came up with the GSI uh, and GDI to include the BRI related projects. We, we will get probably more clarity soon on the GDI, but on GSI, six components were mentioned by Xi Jinping in the four forum meeting this April. So in this meeting, there was the mention about the Pacific Ocean. Uh, Wang Yi went to the went to Solomon Islands, and they started training the police uh, in law and order related issues. So this is.
we are involved in. Uh, this can be a problematic uh, aspect. Uh, so, the good governance in public infrastructure is a very uh, critical aspect uh, when we consider Bangladesh. Uh, the second question that uh, you asked in terms of the and this flexibility brings along with uh, some of the loose ends in, in terms of process quality. Not only um, that, that is where it comes to the environmental aspect, but that is where I'm saying that environmental viability and social viability is very important. Uh, the other aspect that you have mentioned is uh, in terms of the labor um, negotiation in terms of uh, labor ratio and how we use it. Uh, Bangladesh is, is a labor surplus country and we, we are the most uh, densely populated country in the whole world. And I, I mentioned this quite often uh, that uh, our population density is almost at 1200 per kilometer. So it's quite high. Uh, and I, I see no basis with the population uh, density over 600. So you can imagine how, how uh, densely populated our country is. And we have a huge surplus labor growing in terms and conditions in this place. So this is very special. Uh, but this is also true for other projects. I mean, this is a problematic uh, from southern countries as well. When we try to uh, implement Indian AOC, this problem was very much eminent in, in our case as well. So the condition of sourcing was very high, and the only thing that you can implement uh, if there was money is that you could just buy something uh, for Indian cases. So that's why our first uh, Indian AOC and second Indian AOC it, it took ages to implement. So I think uh, when uh, this is on the part of the lending countries, the growing economy that wants uh, that want to be superpowers in the uh, global order, uh, need, they need to think about that if you want to be a uh, superpower, you need to have some uh, flexibility not only in terms of council conditions that serve you, but also serve to the recipient countries, uh, the low income and lower middle income countries like Bangladesh, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Can you come in to uh, Mr. Chairman? Sri Lanka, from February to till now, has created almost a havoc in Nepal. Uh, during that time, when I met some of the minister talking about the beer, I no, 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 beer, no, 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 and all the things. So, Sri Lanka, too, has been created a a uh, very great perception, it's perceived in Nepal and in other countries that how you lease out the inverted cloud and how your infrastructure projects are overestimation, utilities and all of this. And investment is very on, uh, on productive sectors and some of these two that we raised. When we look at the Sri Lanka, it's a eight, almost 8 billion uh, Loan from Sri Lanka. You have taken a very high interest rate, although there are other reasons like for GDP and other electricity available for the less than one percent interest for the other. So, what led to the political leadership to decide on such a costly loan in the country? That's a very good question to answer, and I think I will. And since you are the earlier advisor to the president, and that's why it's a good question for you, Mr. Minister. Maybe you could clarify that I was an advisor to a former president and not the president. Yeah, I've seen that one. But uh, let's, uh, let me put it this way uh, it was certainly not in Sri Lanka's national interest to go in for, for these roles. It's, uh, very clear. It's not just the law, it is the, it's a combination of the well, unfeasible violation of project funded through extremely high interest rate loans at a cost that is far higher than what would be the fair market value or if you have competitively bidding for those contracts. I mean, this also has to be it's not only the interest component of the loan, but the price that you will pay to the Chinese contractor. Far greater than, than you actually get in 
understanding of popular support, the understanding of the need for popular dialogue, discourse, debate in the policy making framework is just not is uh, is inadequate because of their own experience. I mean, I think this is something that, that needs to be explored. Um, it's it's very clear not only from the situation of Sri Lanka where clearly the Chinese uh, involvement was tied to the political project of Rajapaksa political plan, uh, but in other countries as well, when political when public support is moving away from their chosen person, whether that is the Dabi in Libya, whether it is Omar Bashir in Sudan, uh, whether it is the Rajapaksas in Sri Lanka. China is so recognizing. They find it difficult to understand the principle of popular support and public consent because it is not something that is part of their, has never been part of their, their, their dynamic. And, and part of that, and coupled with that, is the functioning of democratic societies which do engage to some extent in a much more robust uh, public debate uh, on these issues. Than clearly existing in China. Thank you. Uh, coming to my colleague Ajay Basakhana. Uh, introducing Ajay, I would like to mention one thing that uh, this Stacey, the basic foundation, me and Ajay GSA started. So he is a founder, pioneer, he invested a lot of energy, time, intellect, he went in Stacey. So I acknowledge this and uh, just six, seven months back he was a research director with the CSE. So she is an advisor to the CSE and chief editor of Google.com. His journalistic passion which we respect much. So with this, uh, already uh, we have been discussing all these issues from 2017-18 about this. BRI, China investment, and other foreign policy issues. When I look at the Nepal China relations, there are some of the issues like Tibet uh, and Communist Party of Nepal. And these are the basic, uh, and earlier it was from before 2015 and 16, China used to deal with the state mechanism, formal mechanism, but after that what we found that the science for policy is in Nepal, I mean one of the strong instruments is the state and the science part. So why is the shifting from that and little bit explore Thank you Vijayji for your kind comment. Uh, and, and I think this is a very important question but also a very difficult one. Uh, and I think we have to go back to uh, the idea of season Jinping's rise and what it means for Nepal. Uh, during research, uh, I found that you know, China's approach to Nepal changed significantly um, after Xi Jinping became you know, China's leader. And this idea of uh, building relations with Nepal has something to do with the idea of policy exchange, you know, in the BRI. But going much further back, uh, when Xi Jinping came to Nepal, just a day before his visit, he uh, published a signed article in Nepali media, where he outlined his blueprint for Nepal-China relations. It was a uh, basically a four-point uh, idea where he said, you know, he categorized them under deeper strategic communication was the first one, uh, broaden practical cooperation, expand people to people exchanges, and enhance security cooperation. Uh, the first one I think is important, and it's not much talked about in Nepal, and in Nepal's case, it's I think very important. What does he mean by people who strategy uh, communication? He, he explains it as a strategy and long-term perspective uh, which Nepal and China needed to adopt. Uh, and this blueprint for our relationship was a state 
He wants all parties and party factions in Nepal to jointly explore a governance model that is conducive to promoting political stability, economic growth, and people's livelihood. So this was his statement to Sinwa. Uh, so this was the first point. The second point is, he said, China supports Nepal in pursuing independent domestic and foreign policy, by which he means that China wants Nepal to become independent of India and the U.S. West's influence. So this is uh, another major focus of China that constantly, you know, this refrain repeats again and again. Uh, and then the third point is China supports Nepal in furthering participation in the BRI. So I think this idea that the West and India are undermining China's interests and given China's ambitions to become a preeminent power in Asia and the world by 2049, uh, China is patiently waiting. So one of the reasons why uh, China saw the failure of its uh, policy in Nepal was, the first was COVID and the second was the political development by which uh, government close to China was replaced by a government that was seen as being close to the US and India. So I think China is still biding its time and there are another several factors which I think uh, in the next decade, it may not be right now, but in the next decade, there are several factors which indicate the possibility that Nepal may once again become closer to China and oppose India and the US. You know, I, I think uh, if I, we have time, I, I will explain those factors later on. Thank you, Ajayji. Uh, Dr. Devendra, uh, uh, you have been in China and you just completed your PhD recently. Uh, actually, when we see the India-China relations, there are very interesting ones that uh, China and India's trade is almost more than 100 billion. And it's a big investment by the Chinese in India. At the same time, we have a uh, since 2020, okay, border border, Taiwan, sometimes in Bhutan, recently in Taiwan. And what we found that uh, these are the issues uh, when we see that uh, there was no reason behind all these borders, you may say, like or the whatever that thing. So how you see the signing in India, right, really? That whether we should uh, resolve border first and then have other uh, uh, have a normal relationship in other aspects. For eight years, from 1981 to 88, Rajiv Gandhi's visit to China, this issue uh, was not resolved. And uh, in 88, uh, Indian government also decided that okay, let us uh, go ahead with uh, negotiations. And for talks on boundary, but we can have also economic relations, and it has had its own uh, uh, regional and global uh, because on the one hand, uh, Soviet Union and uh, uh, China was trying to they were trying to normalize relations, and then uh, you had uh, the withdrawal of Soviet forces from Afghanistan, which was obviously uh, you no. Know, uh, had uh, impact on how uh, impact on Soviet and uh, you know, uh, U.S. and Chinese focus on Pakistan, which led to you know India uh, somehow accepting that okay, let us have uh, economic relations along with India, uh, finding a solution to the problem. But we have problem than that. Why they accepted it till 2012? Uh, when last time India and China signed a protocol or a, an agreement on the rail to boundary, both things went on quite well. But as uh, uh, I said in the presentation, that in uh, the left stand off in 2030, that is the uh, you know uh, a landmark in a sense. After that, we have a in a steady deterioration of relations between the two countries. And right now, as of now, it seems that India is trying to, uh, India is waiting for Chinese reactions, whether China uh, 
reduces tensions along the border. If it does not, then how does India can respond in economic terms? Obviously, India is taking uh, many, many initiatives at regional level. For example, you have India Japan partnership in uh, Asia Africa corridor, then India's uh, partnership with Russia on building the uh, North South transport corridor and another maritime corridor which was announced in 2019 from Vladivostok to Chennai and many others. And now India is also joined the uh, Indo Pacific economic framework and others. So, this, this is the basic, uh, I think, you know, uh, now we have to look at when, how China behaves and what, what India, uh, what actions India will take. Thank you, Dr. Devendra, for coming uh, via a question and session and so in this. Uh, so, uh, Professor, uh, one very important thing what we found that recently, the TDP G20 meeting in Asian summit, G20 meeting, the President uh, C and uh, Prime Minister Modi, they said to him, they laughed to each other, but they didn't meet the bilateral discussion, we didn't find it. In 2018 and 2019, what we found that the President Xi and Prime Minister Modi became a very good friend, listening after Bosley, song scene one, and, uh, and uh, South Indian temples, the, both the leaders were walking on the temple streets. So, uh, what led actually that uh, they were there, and uh, that was many articles at the time written that uh, it's the age of Asian countries, both China and India can lead the world and all these things. There were a lot of articles written in Indian paper as well as Chinese and other countries. But now what we found that uh, to, from 2020 uh, to 20 to till now, the less communication at the top levels and uh, things are that uh, its impact on the Southeast and other countries is bigger. The geopolitical rivalry is creating some trouble for the small countries like us. And uh, when we read the, your Foreign Minister, uh, Dr. Jaisankar, he very openly admitted that uh, there is a trouble, problem, in the Indian channel business. So what actually we are the small countries as I, in the morning I said that we are not capable enough to manage all these superpowers and all. But the impact of all this rivalry coming to Nepal, coming to Bangladesh, coming to Sri Lanka and all these countries. So do you think that in coming future there is a chance of the rest between the two countries? Uh, thank you. I, I wanted to come back to uh, another question which is also raised uh, on uh, India-China competition in the South Asian region. Uh, critical areas. I, I would just highlight one. Uh, there are many areas. For example, China has huge capacity to build up. Um, they do a lot of dredging projects in South China, South China Sea. Uh, huge capacity. mentioned about the inability of Indian companies to finish the job on time. Uh, this is one factor. Uh, all of us uh, will not be able to finish the job because the Chinese have no labor standards, labor laws. Uh, if they have to work for 18 hours, they will work for 18 hours, finish the job and get back to them. That's what the uh, Chinese system is. The Communist Party controls the labor uh, Worker, working class, and they lay down the wages, they lay down the conditions in which you work, uh, and you have to finish the job and get back home uh, with that. Uh, so there is that flexibility which democratic countries do not have. We have labor laws. You can't have more than 10 hours of uh, labor work uh, in, in our societies. You have to shut down the shop by 7 p.m. or whatever time. So these are things that we have. So we, uh, but the most crucial, uh, I think, competition is 
At the 19th Communist Party Congress, the Chinese said that they will export a China model. The China model is uh, basically authoritarian model, Communist Party directed, uh, and uh, they have a set of uh, the state owned enterprise will be the basis for their export model. Secondly, they have also the, the kind of authoritarian system in the, within the, this China model. Chang Weiwei, former secretary to Deng Xiaoping, uh, he criticized democracies by saying that, see, look at these South Asian democracies, they could not deliver goods to the people, that is, economic development, but they transited towards democracy, that is, one person, one vote, and participation in the decision making process of the country. So he criticized by saying, see, look at the Chinese. The Chinese have first created goods and services to the people. They created wealth. Uh, although there is actually a problem with the Chinese economic data, and somebody mentioned in the morning that they have eradicated poverty, which is not true. China did not eradicate poverty. I can go on explaining those things, uh, but uh, this is propaganda. Uh, uh, the most important thing is China wants to export this model of development. On the other hand, all South Asian countries are democratic countries. Uh, every other South Asian country had experimented with democracy in various forms. It is only now the Taliban-led Afghanistan which has not declared uh, democratic institutions. Except for Afghanistan, all the South Asian countries are democratic. So which means then we have actually a potential conflict between China-led authoritarian model and a South Asian-led democratic model. Uh, in this, China influences the democratic model and that is where I see a major challenge. On the second issue on why Modi Xi Jinping meetings in Wuhan and Chennai did not result in any major consequences. I think uh, the main factor was the Galwan incident in June 2020 when 10, 20 Indian soldiers were killed in this skirmish. They were throwing stones and uh, all sorts of things. Uh, although China spends $220 billion in defense budget, India spent $70 billion. They were throwing stones at each other to resolve the problem. You can imagine the the, how defense budget is of no use when it comes to conflict between India and China. Uh, but jokes apart, what is important is we realize that if we sign an agreement with China, China is not going to uh, implement that agreement. We have very precise agreements with China on confidence building measures. For example, we cannot fly closer to the China border about 60 kilometers. We cannot have a military exercise which is closer to the China border for at least 100 kilometers. Uh, if anyone wants to, if China or India wants to mobilize more than a brigade strength, that is 5,000 troops strength, we have to report to the other side, take permission, and then conduct that kind of exercise. We also have a CDM which suggests to demilitarization of the area. So, specific protocols were mentioned in 93, 96, 2005, 2013 agreements. None of these agreements China implemented in 2022 Taiwan incident. We realized that if you sign an agreement with China, China is going to abrogate that agreement tomorrow. So, we are reluctant to sign any agreement with China now, which means we have hit the rock bottom, and that's where. The Thank you, Professor. Uh, now I I would like to have our distinguished uh, participant to have any questions. Uh, so I would like to my friends call it to help them. Mike, right? Okay, Prasno, and Mr. Hiram Uh, thanks to organizers and thanks 
thanks to the presenter. Very illuminating uh, talks you have delivered. My query is, is that uh, when I look uh, below the surface, India is not against Bihar, it is against Sipet because its involvement of territorial poison uh, uh, passing war to you know, occupy uh, this country. Uh, so, uh, because I am uh, looking uh, deeply, why India took heavy loan from AIIP Asian uh, Infrastructure the, uh, Investment Fund, the largest uh, recipient of AIIP, that is uh, the part of the other. Why uh, India is interested in the uh, shipping? Uh, the shipping is through Myanmar, from Kunming to Calcutta, they want to put it there. So, when uh, the problem uh, of territory will be solved between India, Pakistan, and China, there is prospect of joining India in Bihar, and we, as a, um, between two great neighbors, we would like to see let India and uh, China develop their relationship at within uh, 10 to 15 years. The railway connection from Kathmandu uh, uh, to uh, Rakshaw and Kathmandu to um, Rasua. Uh, then we can be linked between two great nations and we can turn the 21st century as a Asian century. Don't you see this prospect within the world of Berlin? Thank you. I'll proceed, please. Mr. Narendi. Anandji. Anybody? Akhilesh. Akhilesh Shubhaya. Thank you, Mr. Uh, my question too is our Sri Lankan colleague. You know, I come, there's enough literature written on all back, let's not say fall back, more, more back pass PRI. PRI investment in Sri Lanka. I want to know what public mood like. Is there any appetite for tiny more or the public blame is more squarely shifted to the political leadership, which was of course very corrupt and incompetent. Or is it combination of both? Thank you. Yes, please. One. मेरो प्रश्न हमरो नेपाली साथी लग भाई बोले नेपाली में बोले और जय पंडित जी में बेल्सन टूर इनिशिएटिव साइन कर दा नेपाली कांग्रेस कई मंत्री होने चाहिए वन रोज यानि पनी सो साइन आस उनको संबंध में नेपाल का पार्टी और भाई नहीं उत्सुक है रहने और गाड़ी बॉडी पर हमी देख सों तथा भी in the discussion, we have seen the thing I am with that is a purely communist ideology that we have got you as a dance is a good train man or another discussion going on. So, I think that the other critics of our highlights from the Sahan Monsaki, Mane, Apex Sharaksu, when you know when you say Mane, Nepal, I think that the purely communist party party is on the साइन आरण नेपाल को बीच में एक कॉमिस आइडियोलॉजी ले मतलब संबंध रखने के लिए नीति और एक्टर ले मतलब बिना सॉफ्टवेयर नहीं हाँ नहीं अनिल जी अनिल जी तो मैं इसे बहुत ही गिरी पड़ा हूँ तो in this season, I have heard lots about the PCI corridor. Uh, to my knowledge, the PCI corridor is a dead concept now. In 2019, during the second PRI conference, it is not included in the you know, larger PRI project. 
So the Chinese have probably after you know going through the same devaluation. So they have lifted the BCI and corridor due to the opposition from India and other countries and included the cross Himalayan multidimensional connectivity network which go through the uh, Kerala to Kathmandu to probably India and Bangladesh. So this is this is one I want to make a small correction here. I think BCIM uh, doesn't you know is going to, or are not going to be included as part of the BRI in the South Asia. Thank you. Professor Dan Prasad Pandit. Thank you. Since we are like uh, talking about VR, why we exclude China in this discussion? Uh, sorry, my friend, uh, <laughs> Professor Dan Prasad Pandit. We have invited China's embassy. And we have also tried to invite the, some the scholar from China with the help of our colleagues, but uh, they refused to join us due to COVID protocol. So that's why we don't have Chinese presence. Thank you. Anybody have any question, Anuradji? I could ask a question to yeah, Professor A uh, couple of days back, uh, recently there was a big, uh, you know, uh, talk about you know discussion between Chinese and uh, Indian side on over uh, Galwan and regularly recurring kind of uh, border conflict. Uh, how how optimist, uh, optimistic are you that uh, this kind of you know talk uh, that has happened over? You know, recent years, uh, is it going to help in de-escalating this uh, recurring border conflict, or do we see this just as a one of those routine, uh, you know, needs that is not going to lead to any substantial long-term settlement? Thank you. So then, I need Sanjuja. Please, one let them stay there. Uh, thank you. China has depicted in the world map two routes. That is one maritime route and the second one is land route. Maritime route connects South China Sea to Calcutta, Colombo and then westward to African Garban as well. And the land route consists from Lhasa to Sigatse and then it goes west to Pakistan, Iran and Europe, etc. etc. On the world map, I looked so many maps of the world map, but Nepal is not connected on map, neither the map, maritime route, nor by the land route. My query to all the families. Why China has not depicted land route from Lhasa to Sigatse to Kero, Raswagadi, and etc. etc. This is my query. Thank you. Thank you. General, General Prasne. Uh, as, as we are actually uh, uh, changing into a uh, New geopolitical environment. What should be the stand of smaller nations when it comes to connectivity, development? Like now we are talking about VI. What about other proposals where it is uh, uh, B3W, Global Gateway, GDI, GSI that we just discussed about, PGI, IPF. So all of these concepts are coming without uh, transparent financing, without structural, and without the uh, a transparent way of fulfilling. So, what do you think in South Asia? I mean, the general question that 
smaller nations should take. Like for example, in my view on PRI, it should Nepal have uh, signed for projects and implementation of projects rather than signing the geopolitical theory. So when it comes to another, other nations uh, coming into the regions with concepts, what should be the answer for small nations so that uh, we develop, we connect, and we do? Thank you, Dr. Bosnia. Anybody? I'm, I'm sorry, sir. I would have to cut short the questions because we are running out of time. If Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. It's the timekeeper order, and I have to follow. So, coming to the third, uh, would you like to insert the. It's correct to say that uh, India partially joined the DRI with AIIB uh, and uh, BCIM uh, as well. Uh, since 1996, there was uh, the Kunming Initiative, uh, and uh, uh, in the first summit meeting of the DRI, it was not mentioned, but in the second summit meeting, there was a map which uh, in Beijing, in the second in the DRI summit meeting, they put up the BCIM also as a uh, one of the uh, routes for the BRI projects. Apart from the six routes, they have also mentioned BCIM and the EC as part of the. Um, uh, of course, uh, this has not really taken off because of uh, other geopolitical movements uh, in the region. Uh, so, so, technically, India is partly part of the BRI on the AIIB is concerned. As Dr. Devendra Singh mentioned in the uh, in his speech, uh, uh, India joined the AIIB because it is market-led. Uh, it is uh, based on demand supply. It is based on global uh, financial uh, related uh, issues. Where we experimented these in IMF, World Bank, ADB, or other lending agencies. Um, based on the project viability, the AIIB also disburses loans or other forms of financial assistance. Uh, and so India joined the AIIB because these are financially sound practices. Uh, China agreed to these things also to experiment because in the future they also would like to get the institutional experience in handling such issues. Uh, compared to the BRI financing institutions like CDB, Exim Bank, uh, CNBC, and others, they have also come along and said that they will operate AIIB purely on professional merits. If this project is viable, they will finance this project. So, and they also have the provisions related to recruitment based on global standards in the bank. So. This is the reason why India joined the AIIB because it is at the global. European Union joined, uh, Russia joined, uh, many countries have joined the AIIB. Uh, so this is the main reason why India joined that. As far as these are market-led, these are uh, financially sound practices, uh, there, there is that hold. BRI doesn't have those and that's the reason why India did not join. But you are right that there is the CPEC project, which is the stumbling block in India's uh, posture on the BRI. Uh, but let me also say this is also about Asian leadership related issues. Uh, BRI, at the end of the tunnel, wants to place China as number one, both in regional order in Asia and the global order. Uh, it's like a Marshall Plan that the Americans contemplated in war ravaged Europe and so the, the BRI end product is to uh, place China at a very high pedestal. India does not agree with this. Uh, we don't agree that China should be number one in Asia or at the global level. We will, we will, we will work with the US, we will work with the European Union, we will work with Japan which used to be number one in Asia. We will work with all of them uh, to 
balance chart. That is clearly our policy. Uh, so we will not join the PRI uh, because it is about leadership issues. It's not about also economic development. It's about leadership issues. And so we will not join that. Uh, it's a larger uh, political issue, uh, BRI. So that's uh, on the territorial dispute. Uh, we have had 36 rounds of discussions for the past uh, these many years. Uh, and we have not found a solution uh, yet between India and China on the territorial dispute. So there are three sectors uh, in which we have not. The China, we have given some of our maps to the Chinese side in the middle sector, but the Chinese have not given their perception of the border uh, to the Indian side. So which means then uh, China is reluctant to resolve this territorial dispute, partly because it's also about what kind of concession that India can make uh, on other issues, for example, on the BRI, for example, even territorial concessions. They want Tawan track, which is part of the Arunachal Pradesh. From Tawan, we have a representative who is now the Union Justice Minister. Now, tomorrow, he cannot be a Chinese citizen if we transfer Tawan to China. Kiran Rajishu is the Justice Minister, Law Minister of India, Union Law Minister. He was the Minister of State for Home Affairs before. Uh, he represents the constituency Tawan. And Tomorrow we cannot transfer Tawang to. We have elected representatives coming from that region. So there is simply no way no Indian government can transfer this uh, to China. So which means we have no solution uh, on this. And China is unwilling to. What the main reason is that sixth Dalai Lama in 15th century hails from Tawang. And so their argument is that since the Dalai Lama belongs to Tibet, Tibet belongs to China. So Taiwan should belong to China. Uh, it, at that rate, there are so many Tibetans living in Nepal. <laughs> Imagine what it means. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, Dr. Topo. Uh, no, I, I think uh, I will go back to the question as to what, what uh, is tension between the and South Asian here. Uh, means for the smaller economies uh, like uh, Bangladesh, uh, Nepal. Um, you see, this is quite unfortunate uh, on our part. So, uh, I mean, as I see it, I'm, I'm uh, much younger than many of you. But South Asia, in general, is probably the least integrated regions in the whole world. And we should reflect uh, to ourselves, why is that? Uh, if you look at Latin America, if you look at Europe, if you look at uh, Caribbeans, um, if you look at any other places, uh, I Africa, there were conflicts and there were uh, disagreements and uh, disputes everywhere, but none of them are in a such a impasse that we have in uh, South Asia. Uh, uh, we have uh, tensions between India and Pakistan. We can never have an effective sum. Uh, we have tensions between India and China. We can never have uh, an effective PCIM. Although PCIM, uh, if you consider it, uh, will connect the, uh, I think, lesser developed Indian region and lesser developed Chinese region. If they, uh, the leaders think uh, very carefully, it is the interest of their own country to have a much working economic cooperation in the region. It is not only about uh, Bangladesh and Myanmar, but then again we have uh, Myanmar and Bangladesh as well, uh, the latest tensions uh, in terms of uh, the Rohingya issue. Uh, so, to be honest, I don't see uh, a lot of progress in the coming years or decades. Uh, I, I may be too pessimistic. Uh, so that is why probably I'm, I'm putting, putting much more importance uh, when we talk about the smaller economies that it is our responsibility to uphold our interests. Uh, we cannot consider that our neighbors uh, will, uh, will actually 
should be continuing to uphold the all international interests uh, in this region. And uh, unfortunately, we have to uh, rely more on uh, our own national interests. Thank you. And there was the one specific question about public opinion in Sri Lanka now that we have got bankrupted uh, and the financial situation. Uh, <clears throat> short answer to that is that the Chinese, if they have invested in anything as opposed to lending, they have invested in what could be called a small grants program throughout society. There is hardly a Buddhist temple, a trade union, a political party, a politician or a journalist who has uh, not got some form of assistance from the Chinese. And these could be trips to be changed for education orientation. Uh, these could be grants for their different programs. Uh, so China has engaged in what you can only call a massive PR campaign in Sri Lanka. Uh, and to some extent, that's legitimate in the sense that I would at least say that every other country has also tried to do such things. I mean, as other countries have, have engaged in small grant programs, there are familiarization tours that are done. But no one has come re remotely close to doing what the Chinese have done. I mean, everybody else combined does not compared to what they will. They will take a hundred journalists to, to Beijing in one go, which is about half of airplane, whereas other countries might do five for the whole year. So uh, as a result of this campaign, uh, which is, you know, I mean, at least if it's made by the rules, it's open. Uh, there is very little criticism of China in Sri Lanka. In fact, it's very difficult to criticize them even in Parliament, you will have random members of Parliament jumping up to defend them cross party. Uh, you do not find them criticized in the media. Uh, so they are not. Uh, clearly, the, the, the projects and its effects are so, for instance, uh, the fact that there are no ships coming to the Hambath of the port is mentioned. Uh, but the criticism does fall uh, onto the to the Sri Lankan government and the decision makers will be there, which is also, I think, uh, justified because clearly the predominant responsibility and the primary responsibility has to lie with the sovereign recipient state that, that did all of this. And the popular protest was also uh, against the, the Rajapaksa regime. Uh, when you had the protest against the regime, uh, you actually did not see much or any protest, if at all. Uh, against China. Now there's localized hostility, for instance, uh, even in the president's own constituency, the fact that large projects take place and you cannot, a local person cannot get a job in a construction project that is going up, that is visible from his village almost, and does cause resentment in surveys and so on. It's like here is this big thing coming up and well, I can't get a job there. Now I'm not even allowed to go there. Uh, and so you have that localized. Uh, interestingly, the narrative has still been spun. That is, you know, the fault of, uh, of the government that has structured, which I guess also it is. I mean, there has been no push for local labor and so on, uh, but whether that would have worked. But to answer your question, uh, no, the Chinese have done their they are working at enormous scale to ensure that there is a, there is a, almost no criticism of them. I think I have a, one question uh, regarding you know how to look critically at uh, the relationship between China and um, the leftist parties in Nepal. And is it too simplistic? That, that appears to be the question. Uh, in order to answer that question, we have to look at uh, uh, several factors. Let's first look at uh, the issue from the Chinese perspective. The first is that uh, China has ambitions to replace 
the international governance order in favor of China, the international finance system in favor of China, uh, and it is actively promoting development and governance models that's favorable to China and in alignment with China uh, throughout, throughout the globe, especially in Africa we've seen uh, that developing to a greater extent than in Asia. But in Nepal's case, uh, it is a more specific uh, and interesting as well. So another element of China is that by 2049 it wants to become the preeminent power in Asia and the world. And until even 2017, when it uh, published the white paper on security cooperation, it mentioned of obviating the need for war or achieving objectives without the need of, of war. But that position has shifted in, in the last four or five years. Now China is prepared for the inevitability of conflict and war. And so its relations with China, with India has shifted because of that. And that is partly because of ideology. And my emphasis on ideology is that since Mao Zedong, this is the first time in China that ideology has become so important because Xi Jinping sees the world and international relations and, and the goals of China through an ideological Marxist like Leninist lens as well as the lens of Chinese nationality. So that's from the Chinese perspective. So let, let's look at Nepal's uh, perspective. Uh, China has, you know, operated its foreign policy in Nepal, mostly through the monarchy. So that was one single institution, which has shifted now. And Nepal is interested in development, of course, and it thinks that China can provide that kind of benefit uh, for Nepal's development. So that's one aspect which attracts all parties, you know, across the ideological spectrum, whether they are left or right or center, everybody believes that China can be a good friend and China can be a partner in Nepal's development. But let's also look at what's happening in recent years. First, a lot of Nepali people are beginning to think that democracy is not delivering. Governance is worsening and we are not able to achieve our development aspirations, economic development aspirations and people are blaming democracy. So that's, that feeling is growing. Uh, another is, you know, uh, the anti-Indian and anti-Western feeling in Nepal, which is also pushing Nepali people, not only parties, but also Nepali people closer towards China. So although there is this, um, at the top, the political alignment now favors the West, given Nepali Congress, leadership in, um, but at the same time, at the, if we look at the larger population base, I think there is greater affinity uh, towards China even now. And given these tendencies, you know, geopolitics, people's dissatisfaction with the West and India, people's dissatisfaction with democracy and their desire for the visible development aspiration that we see happening in China, there is a possibility at one point that you know Nepali people will uh, want to become closer to China, and I think, given this situation, China felt in 2018 that this was an opportunity to work together with the leftist forces, which have not only ideological affinity with China but also nationalist affinity, but also affinity in terms of their aspirations for development. So this was a factor that led to the merger of the communist parties in 2018 and China experimented with uh, these new forms of uh, governance and development model where they could push it through to Nepal as well. Uh, but there was a setback as we have seen and China at the present re appears to be uh, reconsidering its approach or you know reflecting on what worked and what did not work. But at the same time, we need to be aware that China is just biding its time and at one point it will again push for uh, that kind of uh, political realignment. It, 
both in terms of ideology but as well as in terms of bilateral relations. Just one point. Yeah. Yeah. In addition to what uh, Mr. said, India essentially is not against economic project or involvement of any power. Yeah. Why DCIM and uh, AIB? You look at India's uh, economic relationship with China, right? It's increasing by leaps and bounds. So the issue is not about whether which country is investing in India, uh, in South Asia, because all countries need investment as does India. The issue is, in addition to territorial sovereignty, the security implications. And why does this arise? I could not explain during my presentation. It's because we, you have to know what are the security intentions behind a project. So when we see that China is building some projects and uh, it, it sells it as an economic project, but it also has security and military component. So that is not security concern, that that's natural. So, the way out of it is that you have to have a transparent initiative, which is why you can join AI. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, the panel. I have uh, nothing to say that much has been discussed. And uh, only thing I can say that the rivalry between US and China, we cannot do anything. Even between China and India, our role is limited. But its impact on Nepal's small countries like Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Nepal is obvious there. So we have to try to converge our interest with uh, minimum negative impact on our national interest. So we'll keep uh, our national interest, uh, push them according to our national interest. It depends on the political leadership and the bureaucratic leadership that how they deal with the, these all big powers. So in coming days, we have more challenges in South Asia. Thank you very much all the panelists and thank you everyone for participating.